We're standing here on the Trossel Farmyard. We're on July 2nd, 1863 at around 6 p.m. 6 p.m. This became the second position of the 9th Massachusetts Battery. There are three monuments to the 9th Massachusetts Battery, a testament in and of itself uh, to the hard service at the 9th Massachusetts Battery performed here at Gettysburg under the leadership of Captain John Bigelow. Captain John Bigelow is from Boston, Massachusetts. In February 1863, he's called to the office of the governor of Massachusetts, a guy by the name of John Andrews, and he's told that the 9th Massachusetts Battery assigned to the defenses outside of Washington was a constant source of anxiety to him. He said that the 9th Massachusetts was unfortunate in their commander, although our, our, a competent artillery commander, this particular commander was given, as one of the men said, to wine and women, and was determined that the 9th Massachusetts Battery would stay within the defenses of Washington, D.C. And as a result, the 9th Massachusetts was demoralized, undisciplined, and the job that Bigelow would have would be difficult. And that proved to be true when John Bigelow showed up in Washington, he found the men of the 9th Massachusetts demoralized and unhappy because they felt like they were playing soldiers, that that's not why they enlisted. The challenge that John Bigelow faced was huge, uh, but he realized that there are three aspects to change, to bringing change, to turn this undisciplined, demoralized unit into an effective fighting unit. They needed to think differently, they needed to feel differently, and they needed to do their jobs better. There was this rational aspect, this emotional aspect, and this environmental aspect. So John Bigelow realized that he had, in order to bring change to the 9th Massachusetts, he had to appeal to their head, to their heart, and to their hands or their habits, the way they did their job. So John Bigelow, the first thing he did when he arrived, he told the men, we are working, my commander and I, to get the 9th Massachusetts assigned to active engagement in the war. We are going to war. John Bigelow understood what all leaders understand, that men in camp, the morale degenerates, but men in armies and fighting units on maneuver, their morale improves. They needed to be moving toward the enemy uh, in order uh, to uh, take seriously and no longer be playing soldiers anymore. Standard way of thinking within the military that as you're moving to the en to toward the enemy, as you're moving towards the task for which you have volunteered or enlisted, there is a purifying, cleansing, and focusing effect. So the first thing he did was tell them we were going to war. The second thing he did which they didn't like right at first, was he began to instill a regimen of training. He began to change their habits, their hands. Every day, there were eight roll calls. In other words, they showed up for training eight times a day. He began to institute this deliberate and disciplined training. They were all 110 men of the uh, 9th Massachusetts Battery were, were trained to handle every position that every other man. They weren't just assigned one position. They spent days and days training so that they could do every other man's position within the unit. Bigelow knew that training mattered. Uh, so he begins to instill these systems and processes. He shapes the path in a sense by which the, the environment by which the 9th Massachusetts would. That when the occasion comes, men do not rise to the occasion, they default to their training. So he instituted a, a series of training and disciplines and perfecting these systems and processes within the 9th Massachusetts Battery, within the 9th Massachusetts Unit. Uh, at first, the men didn't like it. They, they said he was worse than any of the other regulars that they had been exposed to. In fact, they said he's worse than the master. They, he treats us worse than the master treats his slaves. So they begin to write home about their new captain, begin to write home and say, uh, this, this guy is a tyrant. But over time, they begin to realize as they got better at their job, as they became well-trained, that Bigelow knew his business. Okay. 
Bigelow understood that leadership is fundamentally an enabling act. It's more an enabling act than an empowering act. Bigelow needed to help the men realize they could be strong, that they could be capable. And so by training them and instituting this process as the men begin to like, you know, turn to each other and realize we're really good at this job. And because he had changed their head, they're going to war, because he had instituted the habits of change, these systems and processes, these men begin to, their hearts begin to change. They begin to experience this esprit de corps. They develop this unit identity, this, this sense of commitment to one another. Uh, we'll talk about this at other locations, a sense of communitas, that we are together in this common cause to fight for the Union. Three, Bigelow kept his promise and got the men assigned to the Union Army of the Potomac as it moved north in pursuit of Robert E. Lee, as Robert E. Lee entered Pennsylvania and eventually ended up here in Gettysburg. Initially, the 9th Massachusetts was rushed to the defensive line of Sickles' left flank, or left line, up here about 500 yards to the south of here on Millerstown Road, or was called Wheat, Wheatfield Road there. Uh, the, the men of the 9th Massachusetts, Bigelow noted afterwards, they performed like regulars, even though they had never been tested in battle. They performed like highly trained units, realizing and proving again what is true, that men, you know, when they're in the pressure and the chaos of the war, they don't rise to the occasion, they default to the quality of their training. Bigelow had trained them well. One of the things as leaders we should often always be telling ourselves, training, 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 learning, 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 practice, 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 enables men to do things they did not think themselves capable of before. And that's what was happening with the Ninth. So not only did they hold off the South Carolinians who had attacked on the fields just uh, south of the peach orchard. They kept them out of the Stony Hill. They kept them out of Rose's farm. They kept them initially out of the wheat field uh, for this as they cooperated with the other assigned artillery that were there. And they fought till they were told to withdraw. They only fought, they only withdrew at the point when the 21st Mississippi broke through the peach orchard and had them on their flanks. When Bigelow is told to withdraw, he says he doesn't have time to limber up. In other words, he doesn't have time to connect the horses. And so instead of that, he retires them by prolong. Retire by prolong is a very complicated maneuver by which guns are moved back away from the enemy by the force of their firing, by their recoil. So since he didn't have time, uh, to hitch up the horses and bring them back to this location. Bigelow's men do a fighting retreat across this field uh, as they're moving back. And when they finally get here, and they're about to cross this stone wall off to our left, Bigelow's commander, a guy by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery, rides up and says, you must hold this position. There is no infantry behind you. There is no artillery positions up. I need some time. You have to hold this position at all costs. And the men of the 9th Massachusetts, untested in battle, the first time they face the element, stay here and fight until they, literally the Mississippians are within the guns themselves, fighting hand to hand, trying to defend their guns when in fact, the losses are tremendous for the 9th Massachusetts. Three, uh, four out of the five officers are wounded, two of them mortally. Bigelow himself is shot twice. 80 of the 88 horses are killed. Uh, 27 of the men are become casualties, either wounded, severely wounded, or killed here in this location here on the Trossel Farm. Uh, Bigelow is not very far from here when he is shot twice and falls from his horse. Mississippi soldiers from the 21st Mississippi are all around when all of a sudden one of his men, a bugler by the name of Charles Reed, comes not supposed to be on the battlefield. In fact, Bigelow had ordered him twice off the battlefield. He said, Charles Reed, you're a bugler. You're not a combatant. You should be off the battlefield. But because of the esprit de corps, because of the relationship that existed, because of the community of comrades, Charles Reed had refused to leave. And Reed sees his commander, 
that former tyrant that he called a tyrant earlier. He called worse than a slave over his masters. He sees him fall and, bu and this bugler moves over, picks up his commander, puts him back on the horse, surrounded by Mississippi soldiers who by all accounts probably noticing the bravery of this young bugler refused to fire at the two of them. Charles Reed is able to get Bigelow, Captain John Bigelow off the battlefield. Years later, he would receive the Medal of Honor for his courage in saving the life of his commander, Captain John Bigelow. In 1885, John Bigelow returns here with the survivors to dedicate the three monuments of which one of them is behind me here. Or we <laughs> <laughs> one, of them, one of them is behind me here uh, to dedicate the three monuments. And as he's here, he's talking about the accomplishments of the Ninth Massachusetts. And like all, all good leaders, he points out the accomplishments, their accomplishments, what they accomplished here and not his own. He said in the concluding, yours is a spirited and glorious record. It has been my greatest and proudest recollection and memory to have been here with you. Captain John Bigelow, Gettysburg, July 2nd, 1863.